next speaker is quite knowledgeable in this area and has written a book, uh, Social Security, The Inherent Contradiction. That's the right thing. Uh, he was also the author of uh, the uh, of Ed Clark's position paper on uh, the detailed position paper uh, concerning a phase out of Social Security uh, during the Clark campaign. He's a lawyer, graduate of Harvard Law School, and uh, uh, formerly, uh, just until just recently, the major New York City law firm. Uh, he was the editor of the uh, uh, newsletter of the Center for Libertarian Studies, and uh, a whole host of other credentials that I won't bore you with because I'm going to let Peter Ferrara come up here and uh, tell you about Social Security. Michael. Both the liberals and the conservatives are in big trouble over Social Security. The liberals have always wanted to finance the program out of general revenues. This seems even more attractive now that the program is in such financial trouble. But even liberals have begun to wonder why everyone, including the wealthy and the non-poor in general, should be paid large Social Security benefits out of general revenues. In any event, liberals for the moment feel that general revenue financing is politically infeasible. So their short-term solution to the problems of Social Security is to raise payroll taxes. But the American people don't support further payroll tax increases. Moreover, simply raising taxes will not solve all the problems of the program. The conservatives oppose general revenue financing. Nor, after their successful national campaign last year on an anti-tax platform, can they support further payroll tax increases? Their long-term reform agenda is to privatize at least some aspects of, of the Social Security program. But they presently feel that this, too, is politically infeasible. So their short-term solution is to cut benefits. But the American people don't support cuts in Social Security benefits. Moreover, simply cutting benefits will not solve all the problems of the program. Fortunately, there is a solution to the problems of Social Security that will work that involves neither cutting benefits nor increasing taxes, that should be supported by the public, and that will enact both the long-term agendas of, of both the, liberal, the conservatives and the liberals. This solution involves broad-scale fundamental changes in the U.S. retirement system as a whole that will enable young people entering the workforce today to have a far more prosperous and secure retirement in their future, while at the same time maintaining benefits that the elderly and those near retirement, for whom it is too late to make major changes in the program, have come to rely on. Reform that I will outline here and that I discuss in my book is in fact guided by the principle that everyone should receive at least as much in benefits as they expect to receive from the current system, while today's young workers will eventually receive much more. First, let's review some of the major problems of the program. The program has several powerfully negative effects on the U.S. US economy. The most important of these is, is its negative impacts on saving. Social Security operates on a pay-as-you-go basis. The money paid into the program is not saved and invested, but is immediately paid out to current recipients. The private system, by, contract, by contrast, is, full, is fully funded, with each individual's payment saved and invested for his own benefits. Substituting pay-as-you-go Social Security for this private, fully funded system results results in a massive loss of savings to the private economy. Less savings means less capital investment. Less capital investment means less national income. In 1979, this negative effect of the program alone needlessly cost the American people at least $450 billion in lost GNP, or approximately $2,000 per person. Neither raising taxes nor cutting benefits will solve this problem. Probably the most significant problem plaguing Social Security is the program's developing inferiority to private sector alternatives. Instead of participating in Social Security, as I really don't need to explain in detail to this audience, Individuals could be allowed to use the money they would otherwise pay in Social Security taxes to purchase a package of investments and insurance policies in the private sector, which would provide the same kind of benefits as Social Security. Young people entering the workforce today could in fact receive much more in benefits from this private alternative system. The superiority of this private system is due to the fact that it relies on wealth creation rather than mere income redistribution. The savings and investments of each individual in the private system create or increase wealth and this additional wealth is returned to each individual investor in the form of a rate of return on investment. Over the years, this rate of return accumulates to quite large amounts, and individuals would accumulate huge estates in this way by retirement age. Through Social Security, however, this accumulated rate of return and wealth creation is lost entirely since the program operates on a pay-as-you-go basis and no investments are made. 
That is why in the mature phase, Social Security will never be able to pay as much, as much in benefits as the private system. Now, this is true even though in the early years of the program, individuals did receive much more through Social Security than they would have received through private alternatives. In the early years of a pay-as-you-go program, the startup phase, individuals at or near retirement will pay little or no taxes into the program, yet will receive full benefits. They will therefore receive a very high return on any taxes they do pay. But this is only a temporary phenomenon, since as the program matures, individuals will eventually be paying taxes into it all of their lives. At this point, individuals are simply using the accumulated returns they could receive through the private alternative system, and are therefore receiving lower benefits. I think this is a particularly important point because it indicates why there's been such a change in public attitudes towards Social Security, why it's possible to actually consider major fundamental changes in the program. Up until now, we've been enjoying the startup phase, which takes about a generation to phase in. But that startup phase is now over, and everyone is now going to have to suffer in the mature phase of Social Security, and they are now, I believe, the public is much more willing to consider broad-scale fundamental reforms. To understand the magnitude of this problem, if we focus on young workers entering the workforce today, these workers at all income classes could, through the private system, receive more than twice what they would receive through Social Security, and in some cases, more than six times. Social Security is therefore literally impoverishing young workers entering the program today, and this incredible unfairness to these workers simply must be rectified. Again, simply raising taxes or cutting benefits will not solve this problem. Another overwhelming problem of the program is its potential bankruptcy. This involves both a short-term and a long-term problem. In the short term, the combination of inflation and recession over the past two years has again brought the program to the brink of bankruptcy. In a recession, tax receipts fall because employment and wages grow more slowly or decline, and therefore the pay payroll tax generates less revenue. If inflation continues at the same time, however, expenditures increase since benefits are indexed. The recent combination of both these economic trends has brought Social Security to the point where it will be unable to pay all its promised benefits some point in the next two years without some significant changes in the program. Indeed, Budget Director David Stockman said just this week, testifying before the Senate, that unless something is done soon, quote, the greatest bankruptcy in history will occur on or about November 3rd, 1982. All of this less than three years after the Social Security <coughs> Board of Trustees stated in their 1978 annual report that the mammoth 1977 tax increases had ensured the solvency of Social Security, quote, throughout the rest of this century and well into the next one. Right. The long-term bankruptcy problem is due to the, to the profound changes in American demographics over the past 40 years. The following up of the post-war baby boom with the baby bust of the 60s and 70s means that the workforce will be declining just as the retirement of the baby boom generation will be increasing benefit recipients. As a result, though there are 31 beneficiaries per 100 workers today, by 2025, when today's young workers are retiring, there is likely to be 62 beneficiaries per 100 workers and by 2035, 73 beneficiaries per 100 workers. Because of these changing demographics, in order to pay the benefits promised to young workers entering the workforce today, Social Security taxes will have to be increased from the current 13% of payroll to 25% to 33% of payroll. The specter of Social Security taxes alone consuming 25% to 33% of the income of most Americans should be frightening. It is my opinion that the public will not support such tax rates. People have other things they want to do with their lives besides pay taxes. Social Security program will thus not be able to meet all its future benefit obligations and can consequently be considered bankrupt. Moreover, I would also consequently advise young workers entering the program today not to count on receiving all the Social Security benefits currently being promised to them and to not make their future plans based on such benefits. I also think that it is an outright scandal that the Social Security benefits promised to these young workers are not only inferior to those available from private alternatives, but are also unlikely to ever be paid. These bankruptcy problems are all due to the fact that Social Security does not have a true trust fund or saved up, saved up assets to finance benefit obligation, and instead relies on current workers through its pay-as-you-go system of financing. If the earnings of these workers are insufficient to cover benefits due to poor economic performance, or if their number is inadequate due to changing demographics, the system runs into deep trouble. In the long run, without saved up assets, as in a private system, these problems will continue to plague the program no matter, no matter how much taxes are raised or benefits cut. Final problem of the program to be noted is its serious restriction of individual liberty. 
The program is quite simply compulsory. All Americans are forced to participate regardless of their preferences. As a result, individuals lose control over a substantial portion of their incomes, a portion which may in the future rise to as much as a fourth to a third. It's hard to understand why people who like to think of themselves as liberals have not been concerned over this serious loss of liberty. Freedom to control one's income is surely at least as important to the average American as the other civil liberties which have received so much emphasis in recent years. Again, I note that simply cutting benefits will not solve this problem, and God knows that raising taxes won't. There are many other problems with the program, but the message by now should be clear. Social Security has grown too big, and its negative impacts on American life have become too severe for the program's major defects to continue to be ignored. If these problems with the program can all be solved, if we can, tra can transcend the conservative liberal dichotomy of raising taxes and cutting benefits, let me outline a reform proposal which will do precisely that. The first step in such a reform is to abolish the payroll tax. Individ individuals will then each be allowed to save and invest the amounts they would have paid in Social Security taxes in their own individual retirement accounts. Through these individual accounts, individuals could not only make investments for their retirement, but could also purchase life, disability, and health insurance, establishing an overall package which will provide all the types of benefits which Social Security does. All investments made through these accounts would be fully tax-free so that individuals would receive the full before tax real rate of return on such investments. At the same time, Social Security benefits would continue to be paid out of general revenues, as liberals have all long advocated. Such benefits would re be reduced over time, however, by the amounts which individuals had earned through the private alternative system. Eventually, therefore, such benefits would be completely phased out, along with the need for subsidies from general revenues. But at all times, Social Security to at all times total benefits from both the private and public systems would be at least as great as expected benefits under the current system. Concerns that the poor would be unable to save sufficient funds under such a system could be met by updating the currently existing SSI program, which, which pays benefits out of general revenues to the elderly poor based solely on need. What to do with this program from a libertarian perspective, this SSI program at a later date, would be a matter for a, general, for a study of general welfare reform. Fears that individuals would not voluntarily save and make retirement investments and insurance purchases on their own could be answered simply by uh, a short-term requirement that they do so if it was necessary to make the reform politically feasible. While such a requirement is obviously objectionable from a libertarian standpoint, it would allow the rest of the reform to go through intact, and it could always be phased out later. I, for people who speak on, on these issues and discuss these reforms around the country and their experience is the same as mine, the constant objection is people won't save on their own. And I can argue about paternalism all I want, but no one's going to, they, they, they don't believe me. So I say, all right, so just require them to save for now, and we'll get the rest of the reform through. The immediate result of such a reform would be to increase savings and capital investment by well over $100 billion per year. This would result in a commensurately substantial rise in GNP, eventually re re reaching an increase of 20%. At the same time, today's young workers would receive far greater benefits than under the present Social Security system, since their retirement savings would accumulate along with a substantial rate of return. The financing problems of the program would also be solved, since each individual would be saving up his own trust fund to finance his own future benefits. Even with a savings requirement, individual liberty would be increased, since individuals could choose their own package of private alternatives. Once the requirement was phased out, total liberty, total liberty will, will have been achieved. As a side benefit, it should be noted that as a result of this reform, total federal spending would have been permanently reduced by at least one-third. Yet, we have accomplished all this without increasing taxes or cutting benefits. This is made possible by the wealth creation aspects of the private system. The additional wealth created by the investments in this system not only allows benefits equal to those promised by Social Security to be paid without increasing premium payments over the amount of Social Security taxes that would have been paid, but it allows even greater benefits. Both permanent tax increases and benefit cuts could therefore be avoided while solving the program's financing problems and allowing younger workers to receive much higher benefits. There's still one problem with this reform, however, that we haven't addressed. Social Security benefits would be financed out of general revenues with no payroll taxes. The immediate result would be a general revenue deficit of over $100 billion in the first year. Though over time this deficit would be reduced, it still would be a major problem for a few years. In an ideal world, this deficit could be made up by cutting other government programs and selling government assets. But I, this course is not likely to be fit politically feasible until we can elect Ed Clark president. In order to make this reform feasible now, therefore, we need to take another approach. 
This approach would involve breaking up the reform into small pieces and phasing it in more slowly over time. A way to do this was, in fact, unwittingly chartered in, of all unlikely places, the Carter administration. The Carter Commission on Pension Policy came out with a report at the very end of Carter's term, recognizing many of the shortcomings of the Social Security's pay system, which I have discussed. <coughs> to solve these problems, the report recommended increasing reliance on fully funded private alternatives to Social Security. To accomplish this, the report recommended requiring employers to contribute 3% of payroll to private fully funded pensions for their employees, with most of this 3% deductible from the employer's income taxes. This proposal would have cost the federal treasury approximately 40 to 50 billion dollars per year. I would modify this proposal in a few respects to make it more consistent with my long-term reform proposal. I would allow both the employer, I would allow both the employer and the employee to contribute 1.5% of taxable payroll to a private fully funded system for a total of 3% and allow them to deduct this from social security taxes rather than payroll taxes. For employees who took advantage of this possibility, Social Security benefits would be reduced by a proportionate amount. If all workers took advantage of this possibility, it would cost less than $40 billion a year in lost revenue. This is a per perfectly feasible amount for the government to absorb over a number of years as a result of a tax cut. After a few years, this 3% figure could be raised to 6%, then to 9%, and, and, and onward in small bites until the Social Security payroll tax was completely eliminated and the new system phased in. The government could periodically increase the percentage whenever it would otherwise have enacted an income tax cut. This would make the entire reform easily fiscally and economically work workable. Now, modified in these ways, I frankly cannot think of any reason why anyone, whether conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrat, rich or poor, labor or business, black or white, should oppose this reform. It holds the promise of making everyone better off and no one worse off. Indeed, perhaps no other single reform could so much increase could so much increase the freedom and prosperity of the American people. I, I, since I went through this complicated uh, reform proposal and expressed some new ideas, uh, I'd be willing to uh, accept any questions that people might have at this point. There must be some questions. <laughs> I don't think I answered everything. Roy! Yeah, uh, what groups do you see as being major obstacles to getting this accepted? Because to me, you've done it. You find a way to get out of this nasty little system that is really going to become quite oppressive in a few years. What groups besides Social Security bureaucrats maybe do you see as really opposing it? Why? I, I, I can't think of any major public interest group that should oppose this once they, once they uh, understand it. There may be some people out there who just uh, measure the, the goodness of a society by the amount of federal spending, and for them it will alienate, but I don't think they're a major, a major voting block at this point. How do we get around the image question? Look, when Reagan proposed these little, little changes that he proposed, a billion people descended on, on the Capitol, and you saw it on TV, uh, you're in Washington now, the hearings and everything, and it's one old person after another running up there screaming about starving in the street. It seems to me that that, just that image problem, how do you get around that? Well, I think that that, that was the result of his, they, they want to do it the hard way. They want to cut benefits. And I think that opens up the opportunity for something like this, because now I can rush out and say, no, let's not raise taxes or cut benefits. Let's do this instead. Let's just get rid of the whole thing. And uh, uh, then you don't have a situation of people saying they're going to starve, because at, at, I mean, my objective in this was to design something that would move us forward without alienating any group. And while, uh, you know, you might, there's an SSI program here and a, and a savings requirement there, by putting these things in, I think we got something that can be, that any old Democrat or Republican could vote for. And uh, <coughs> something that could happen in the next four to eight years. And uh, I think that, I think that what is happening now is very useful. Uh, that Ray, by Reagan making uh, these proposed budget cuts, has completely turned around the whole Social Security issue. People are open to new ideas. Everyone realizes that the, the whole problem is, is intractable. And I, I think that what he's done will not, I think that what they propose will not be successful in solving the problems of the program in the way they expect. What it'll do is make people turn to something like this just through the logic of events. You think that, a, that you ever try to talk to somebody like Jack Kemp about it to see if you can get an interested or Ron Paul? Well, I, I suggested to Ron Paul that this could be his Kemp Raw, but he's in, he's in enough uh, hot water, enough things that, as it is. Eventually, eventually, I think some smart young guy, who's a congressman, is going to pick up this and run with it. 
and he's going to ride the, ride the national prominence on it. But I haven't found that guy yet. Why don't you run to talk slower and run for office? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, well, it, there's two answers. One is it's not the, the benefit, even with the savings re, uh, requirement, is that you privatize this enormous, you denationalize this enormous social security system. It's being operated in the private market instead of in the public market. People can choose in the private market more of one, less than another. They can choose the kind of coverage they want. There's a lot more freedom involved. <coughs> and it, once that the, the, once that new system is phased in. The difficult part is dealing with the unfunded liability. Once we get to the point we can get out from under this burden of providing benefits to people who are now old and have relied on this thing and uh, 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 haven't saved up any other alternatives, yet we're developing this funded system. Once we figure out a way of getting out of that, a, a, a savings requirement or savings restriction could be phased out later. It would be it would be more obvious to people once they see how this private system works. It would be more obvious to them once it's intact that say, all right, now all we have is this, this stupid savings requirement, let's let's phase that out. In other words, I think to make it politically possible to start moving, it will just put them in order. I mean, I am opposed to a savings requirement. It's unnecessary government paternalism. In my book, I have, you know, all these pages of philosophy explaining why, it, why, it's, why it's so good. But uh, not everybody reads all this philosophy, and so to make this into something that I hope can happen in the near term, I think this is the way to do it. Yes. I think you're really right about that brick wall. All that philosophy won't do much about the brick wall of people saying, but nobody will say. That's what I keep running into you know, when I suggest that sort of idea. Um, but I was just wondering about a couple of, to clarify in my mind, what, what you're, you're proposing in, in particular. The older people who are near retirement age would not be paying any payroll tax at all, but they would collect the entire benefits that they would, ex that they would expect any they also pay that one and a half percent into their private everybody private below the age of 65 would have would pay the the, the 1.5 percent from there and their employer into this private system until they got to be 65 mm -hmm. then they would their social security benefits would be reduced by the amount in this private alternative so that they would continue to receive the total they expected otherwise but they it would get partly from the social security system and partly from the private system right, that's right Yes. How long would you expect an individual to have, have to say, an idea of what age would he have to start this plan to completely be independent of Social Security? It might not be his entire life. He could maybe go from 50 to 65 and have accrued sufficient assets to provide similar benefits. What is that cutoff? Thing? I think it's some. It's uh, around the age of 35. I think is what that cut -off, cut off age is. It depends on what your assumed real rate of return is. It depends on what investments you think are feasible. I think that the age you could get as high as 40 if you uh, were willing to put all your assets into, into a wide distribution of common stocks. Uh, like a lot of retirement investment advisors don't recommend that people do that. I'm, I'm not sure why that is because if you buy enough of a broad range of stocks, you'll be, your risk will be spread enough so that won't be a problem. Yes? Who selects the savings vehicle that the private person would put his funds into and how do you regulate the... Uh, the insistence that he saves some of his money? Well, the private person would choose to be a the saving vehicle on his own. Uh, I would hope to resist any regulations on what he could save in. Uh, individual retirement accounts currently have a lot of regulations, and as part of the reform in my book, I discuss getting rid of those because those regulations force the rate of return that can be earned by those uh, retirement accounts down. So. I mean, I certainly for this group, I don't need to explain why you don't need, you don't want to have regulations on, on the vehicle savings vehicles. Yes? There's, uh, really, there's two problems in this. One is the, uh, let's say, two other brick walls. One is it relies on a certain amount of basic economic knowledge, which is not very great in this country. People have, are fairly good on the microeconomics of their own household, but are terrible on uh, microeconomics applied over, a, you know, big economic pictures. 
Uh, so that's a big problem. The other problem is uh, when you say that they would be free to and put their savings into any of a number of vehicles for uh, retirement, people will say a number of uh, people will say, well, those are all much more risky than putting it in the government hands, which are stable and, you know, rock and Gibraltar and all that garbage. Be, and it's, and it's <coughs> partly true. Some of the money that people will be putting into retirement plans will not come back because they'll be putting it into bad companies. Well, under this system, people would still have the option, if they like the government's the security they think they get from the government, to buy U.S. Treasury bills, and they'll be guaranteed. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they can count on the government to pay that back. Uh, so I think that was a, was a nice way of getting around that problem. Um, the, the, the problem that some people will lose their money is true uh, uh, to an extent. I mean, there are some long-term safe investments that you can get a reasonable rate of return on where it would be difficult to lose all your money. Some people might want to invest in riskier investments, and I don't want to prevent them from doing that. The fact that there, an SSI program currently exists to pay welfare benefits to elderly people who are poor, I would think takes care of that problem because you know, at least at least for now, later you might want to get rid of that too. But right now, uh, the, the existence of this program means that people who lose their money uh, speculating riskier investments still won't starve because there's still this program to, to take care of that problem. Sure. Yes? Uh, you had mentioned, and also a uh, congressman on television last week mentioned that uh, uh, the Reagan's program was uh, going to uh, break the promise, the promise was the word you used and, and he used, uh, of Social Security, the promise that it's made to the American people. I don't know what that promise is. For, for example, uh, someone bought a car when there was no uh, speed limit of uh, 55, and then they reduced it to 55. There was never any promise that it was going to stay at, at 60. Is there some kind of a promise of Social Security? Well, I don't think the I think there's a problem with Social Security, and I don't think it's analogous to buying a car when there wasn't a speed limit of 55. Uh, it was sold to people on the on the premises that they were going to get certain benefits when uh, uh, they retired. I don't think it's of the same uh, a sense of obligation as a contractual promise because it was a public program and people didn't individually agree to enter into it. Uh, uh, Reagan's pro program runs into that problem because they have kids cutting benefits. My program doesn't run into that problem because I don't advocate cutting benefits, but instead phasing the system. I think that uh, this is, you're never going to solve the problems of the program by cutting benefits. You're never going to be able to cut them enough. You're never going to be able to abolish Social Security just by cutting benefits. So there's no use in even wrangling over that issue, I don't think. Yes. How persuaded are you by the evidence that uh, Social Security program, in fact, reduces capital formation in the country? Could you say something about the evidence and how persuasive you find the evidence? Well, I think this, the evidence is overwhelmingly persuasive. Now, there's a tremendous debate about this in economic circles, and uh, there's a thing about economists, uh, uh, a legalistic aspect towards them. They sort of beat the data until it confesses, and everybody gets what they want. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw an economic study that didn't come to the result this author wanted. Um, uh, so I repeat the question, what's the evidence? Well, let me, let me, I'm not done yet. <laughs> Martin Feldstein is the uh, professor of economics at Harvard University who's done the most in this area. Uh, and uh, he's got a series of econometric studies, and he's got opponents who have a series of econometric studies, and they argue over which variable should be in the equation. And you can argue over that for the rest of your life, and none of them really know but what the absolute answers are to that. The problem is that the theoretical basis for the models of Feldstein's opponents don't make any sense. And the theoretical basis for Feldstein's model makes an awful lot of sense. There's one guy who uh, seems to be good on other issues, but on this issue he seems very weak. His name is, is Barrow. And uh, he argues that the Social Security didn't reduce private savings because everybody saved their Social Security benefits to offset the transfer from, to them from their children, that they had a certain amount they wanted to give to the children when Social Security enacted this transfer from the children to them. They just saved the money so they could give it back to them when they re when they retired, uh, when they died. Uh, I don't. They haven't shown that that did happen. All the theoretical constructs which back the alternative models that oppose Feldstein are uh, are based on similarly uh, similarly weak analyses. Um, there was a big controversy recently where some Social Security uh, Administration economists uncovered a calculating error in some of Feldstein's studies. Uh, and when they ran it with the, with the error change, they found no impact on savings. But uh, 
Uh, Feldstein corrected that area, ran his own studies, and found the same big impact. But that, what I'm really leading up to is, I think all this empirical argument is irrelevant, because what you should think of it as, is in terms of opportunity cost, if we enacted this reform proposal, there would be this enormous amount of savings, because people would be investing in this alternative. Let's, I, I don't care really what people would have done over the past 40 years. What I'm talking about is what people are going to do over the next 40 years. If they enacted the savings the program, there would be this enormous increase in savings, there would be this enormous increase in GNP, and the current Social Security program is causing a loss in savings equal to that in terms of opportunity cost. It's forcing the American people to forego that opportunity, and, there, and that is the real reason why it's causing the savings loss. So I don't think this econometric study really argues is really relevant to the major policy question, which is what should we do from here? Okay, I, I wouldn't want to argue with you on the econometrics because I'm quite familiar with that debate that you're citing, and, and I agree with you that you can speak that evidence to death if you get to say anything you want to say. But I, I do think that you should be aware, and that the people of this body should be aware, that Barrow's argument is really quite an important argument because it, it is a very strong attack on the whole Keynesian philosophy that we can fool ourselves into thinking we're wealthier simply by creating debt for ourselves. If you take his argument and apply it to the government debt, and the whole idea that the government can stimulate the economy by, by increasing the debt, you'll find that it's an argument that we really want to be uh, favoring, I think, or, or at least thinking very seriously about. So I, I hope that, that people would consider that argument a little bit more carefully than, than to say it's, it's, obvious, it's obvious that people aren't uh, many younger people generational transfer, so well, it's not obvious. Barrow's is an historical question. What's that? And Barrow's argument is based on historical, uh, is an historical question. And for Barrow to be correct, individuals <coughs> in the 1940s and 1950s who received their social security benefits would have had to save them. And I contend they didn't do that. I contend they spent those benefits and then they bought the food and clothing and housing with them. I, I just, all I want to say is I think that there is something to that arg the argument that he's trying well, to make. I, mean, I, I know a little bit more detail on it. Uh, he's taking the, the, an argument to an, to an extreme. There's a theory that's popular among University of Chicago economists that everything the government does has no effect because the market offsets it. And it's a market-oriented argument. And I don't think it applies in all circumstances. If it was true, there'd be nothing for us to worry about. There'd be nothing for us to worry about, and we could just all laugh every time they announce a new program. Or what we do, but I think it doesn't work out. That well. okay, I'm, okay. Yeah, I had a question. I'm, I don't think I uh, completely understand. Uh, what your program is, because it seems like we're getting something for nothing out of it. The people who have paid in uh, are, you know, they're going to be getting their benefits once they reach 65. If the people now are enabling to stop paying in. Now, the, we, we have to get some increased production from somewhere to pay those additional benefits. And the money that's being saved is now it's being, being built up, and it's not being consumed. It's being used to increase the wealth. Where does the additional production come from? Well, I discussed that. Maybe I, uh, well, I don't I didn't. Fast, did, but uh, the money is saved and invested. And the theme cap, there's $125 billion paid in Social Security taxes a year, approximately, right now. If you took that money and you saved and invested it, you would increase wealth through those that had that extra $125 billion in investment, would increase wealth by the full before tax rate of return on that investment, or about 13% a year. So in the first year, you'd get an increase in wealth of about $10 billion. And well, well, in the next year, that would accumulate the, farther and farther. You're still paying out to all the people who are receiving the Social Security benefits who are consuming... That's out of general revenues. Okay, but that's still... It's, it's a cost, and it has to be produced somewhere. Where is it coming from? It's, it, it's a cost that comes... It's produced somewhere. That's right. It's produced at, over the long run. It's paid for by the increased wealth that is generated out of... There's two ways it comes from. It comes out of this increased wealth that's generated by the private system's investments. And it comes through this reform proposal out of cutting other government or restraining the growth in other government expenditures. Because this, like they have a 3% in the first year, because this $40, $50 billion is going uh, to have to be made up, uh, come out of general revenues to pay for Social Security benefits over those, uh, but when that 3% reform is enacted, that's $40, $50 billion less than would have probably been spent on some other government program. So the combination of those two factors is the way I finance the way out of this program. You rely on the increased production of the, of the uh, private, uh, private system through the investments, and you rely on squeezing some of the other government programs and using that money to phase out the Social Security reform. You could think of the Social Security reform as a program that costs this much every year. 
but as long as you don't increase general revenue taxes, it's not a burden on the people. It's something that comes from causing government programs to compete with each other. Yeah, we could take two more questions if they're fairly good. All right. Uh, I think what I heard the first time around when we started was that you were going to have this short-term bulge in uh, the increase in the general revenue deficit. Right. Now, that, I think, is going to be the cost, the short-term cost. You're going to have a large inflation for a short period of time. You're going to shoot the interest rates way up and have a depression. Well, well you're not going to have either of those. You wouldn't have, it depends on how you finance the deficit, uh, whether you get either of those two. Those two a couple ways of financing it could result in those two things. That's why I advocated breaking it up in small pieces, because this is what more mainstream Republicans and Democrats say. They say, we agree with your critique of the system. I think, you know, you're right, but this $100 billion deficit is too much. So that's why I'm trying to develop a way to break it up in small pieces. The smaller piece reform means a, a, a deficit of 40 or $50 billion a year, which is just your typical any year old deficit that comes out of cutting uh, taxes periodically, which people do. I, and I think I would think that we're going to continue to cut taxes. What I'm saying is, if future tax cuts, after they do these Kemp Rock series of cuts or anything else, if future tax cuts are focused on Social Security payroll taxes for a while, instead of income taxes, and, and phased in along with this kind of program, that thing can be uh, consumed by the government without creating, uh, without increasing general revenue taxes or without causing inflation. Yes? It seems that what you're, what you're doing in some sense is cutting everybody below 35 off, and you're phasing out everyone above that 265. So you've got, if you will, at the top of that triangle, everybody that's yeah, 40, right. they, some of them don't provide for some of their retirement. That's your bulge. And basically you're saying the government will absorb that out of other services. If that's not what you're saying, then I don't understand. <laughs> um, that's why I wanted to, to uh, that, that's why I wanted to outline it in, in detail. The, 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 the money comes here because we're going to do this instead of other tax cuts. I'm assuming that periodically the government cuts income taxes to stimulate the economy or because periodically somebody wakes up to the idea that taxes are too high. So I'm saying the future tax cut, when future tax cut times come up, let's do this. Let's, raise, let's first enact a thing up to 3% and then let's do it up to 6% and let's do it up to 9% instead of doing those other tax cuts for a while. And that will phase this whole thing out. I, I hope that's clear. I think we're going to have to cut it off. I'd like to thank uh, the 